Hi, my name's Cameron Carlson from the Anime Location.tv. I'm here with the lovely, legendary Miss Sandy Fox. How are you doing? Hello, Cameron. Hi. <laughs> All righty. You're just so much fun. So it says in your bio that you happen to be in the new Sailor Moon franchise. What does it mean for you to be able to come into that franchise and also bring life back into it after 20 years of uh, so much fan passion? Um, it is such an honor because I know um, I have such a responsibility to really bring Chibi Yusa to the world and in a way that, you know, that it honors the character and the series and the manga and the writing. So it's just, I'm so grateful and I'm so excited. And it's Sailor Moon is so much bigger than I even ever realized yeah. till I start started um, voicing Chibi Yusa. So it, it's just always an adventure. I love coming to cons. I love talking to the fans. And um, I love being on this journey with my character because I didn't really grow up with Sailor Moon. Yeah, yeah. You know, I've been doing anime 25 years, but it was, you know, I'm a little older than when people grew up with the series in the 90s. So for me, I'm just kind of experiencing Chibi's journey through the writing and my recording sessions. So it's awesome. It's really, really awesome. And I'm Black Lady as well. So, you know, that transition. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, the Black Moon Clan and all of that. And, and just her journey, what she was going through at that time, that self-doubt and yeah, everything. that There's a lot to her character, and she's very complex. And, you know, she's on, on that path of the hero's journey, too, as well. So it's very exciting. I say I was, like, I think maybe, let's see, 1992. I would have been about five okay. when the original series came out. Yeah. So I, I grew up with it. But like I said, I didn't actually get to catch the whole thing all the way through. So I might eventually go back and watch the old stuff with Crystal now. Yeah, and you have to watch the new Viz Media dub. I mean, the new dub is so incredible because um, they, didn't cut out. they didn't cut anything out. And it's very inclusive and it's very true to the original manga and the story. And it's so powerful and it's so empowering to everyone. And I love that, that, you know, that that's the kind of media we want to share with the world because then the world will be in return more compassionate, more open, you know, more informed that, yeah, this is just more people having different relationships and we all love and care about each other. So it's very exciting. Actually, I'll tell you a fun fact about uh, the original uh, dubbing of uh, Sailor Moon. It was actually done by Toledo native uh, Fred Ladd, who is the original director of Astro Boy in the 1960s. Oh, wow. So he's been doing anime. He was the original director and producer of the show for Deke in 1992. Yeah, Deke. In 92, and I actually moved to Los Angeles in 91, and I was like, you know, one of the first people because of the nature of my voice invited by Bang Zoom Studios and ZRO, and that's where they did Ghost in the Shell, and, and they did Akira, and yeah, yeah, so so those kind of shows, you know, I, that's where we learned to dub. I mean, we actually learned dubbing back then. It was very underground. People weren't even selling the product. It was like people were trading and then you know then it kind of, and then it kind of grew into that you know amazing industry i knew it would go mainstream i i didn't, didn't know when. i didn't know when yeah yeah, yeah 20 25 years later <laughs> all righty uh, so uh, you've now been the voice of mo one of the most iconic women of doing animation Betty Boop yeah. so what's it like I mean you've taken on her role so well I mean she's just been a wonderful classic cartoon that survived the 1930s to now so what's it been like to to step into that well she not only survived Betty Boop is the very first talking cartoon she's what they call the queen of cartoons and my Betty Boop story is so interesting because in the early 80s I moved to Orlando Florida right after high school to work for Disney and I was an entertainer and a singer and a dancer and at nights I was working at this very cool kind of Bennigan's you know just yeah, kind of a yeah bar. it was just like a pub or whatever but I was the woman at the door in the hostess and I would hello nice to meet you and at 2 30 in the morning last call for alcohol you know <laughs> making those last calls and this man with a paper collar and you know 23 skidoo he's like well hello there you sound just like Helen Kane and I'm like who in the world Helen Kane I'm like 18 years old right I don't know he's like do you sing come audition for my orchestra so I actually sang with a 1920s jazz orchestra for 11 years I toured with them singing the songs of Betty Boop wow. so that was my first foray into Betty Boop and then some one time somebody said can you dress like her 
<laughs> and you know, like for costume parties and events. And so I started, you know, doing that. And then I, that forayed into my work at Universal Studios, Studios Hollywood, yeah. being the voice of Betty Boop and coming out there as the living Betty Boop. <laughs> Went to tour Japan. That was my introduction to Japan. Betty Boop's been like my cartoon angel. Like she has been my angel throughout my career that moved me from Orlando to Los Angeles and then in Los Angeles doing Betty Boop for Universal Studios Hollywood and then eventually uh, a chance to go to Japan. yeah and then after Mae Questel passed away after Roger Rabbit uh, I think it was like 95 yeah, she passed really away true, yeah. yeah and um, and then I got you know I got the call a few years ago we're doing Betty Boop toys we're doing some Betty Boop shorts you know animated shorts can you go to Paris and do the Lancome commercial I said sure it was like my birthday present like my 50th birthday I got to go to Paris yeah. and and voice Betty Boop in France and it was amazing so yeah so I just did the line of five singing toys actually wrote some of the songs on the toys yeah so it's um very exciting Alrighty, and now um, you also got to be in the Ghost in the Shell uh, project and franchise. What's it like being? The Thank you, <laughs> the Fukukomas. Let me say it, Tachikoma. <laughs> so, is it like bringing so much fun to that? Because we just got done with Miss uh, Julia uh, Madeline. Yeah. So, what's it like, Ma Madalena? Thank you. So, what's it like, you know, just being the funny, goofy, funny, high-pitched, lovable characters in the show versus how dark it is and 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 you know how heavy it is? What's it like just being able to have fun with it? Well, you know, that was really fun, and and we didn't have to put on those voices they just cast the cutest you know voices <laughs> all come in in one room and we would sometimes record like there was about six of us six yeah. to eight of us and certain times for the group stuff and then me and Julie and Rebecca Okowski would do a lot of the other individual right. work as well you know bato bato but we didn't know how dark goes in the show because we you know in recording anime you come in for your part of the show and then you go away so then years later after you watch it right you really realize how dark it is. and how amazing the philosophy behind Ghost in the Shell and how we're actually in 2017 experiencing a lot of the AI they just shut down those robots because they developed their own language and their own, and their own ability to walk and their own ability like started taking over right so and then Ghost in the Shell you know the humans were becoming more machine and the machines were questioning life Life. Yeah. And who am I? And how do I get to, you know, I want to, I want a ghost yeah. too, you yeah. know, you're so lucky you have a ghost when you die, you know, so it's really interesting, an interesting time. And recently, a year, about a year and a half ago, the first assault game, mm -hmm. I was called back in to voice a touchy coma. Mm -hmm. So I was really hoping when the movies comes out, you know, that they would not be cool AIs, you know, but really bring back the, the funniness, the, the touchy comas, because it is a, a great dynamic yeah. against you know it, it's character. and it's not just comic relief but it's just like that they're questioning that world yeah. you know and it's the coolest show yeah and we we've had panels in the past discussing with uh, Richard Epcar the philosophy yeah, yeah. He's Bato, yeah. yeah. The philosophy of Ghost in the Shell. I mean, it's still we're still we're we're living it now. So it's good that we we question those things, right? Yeah. I, well, we got to meet Richard last year, so it was a lot of fun. Oh, cool. Yeah. Very cool. He's awesome. He is. Uh, so anime has changed a lot as we've discussed since you joined the industry 25 years ago. I mean, it used to be cells, it used to be hand painted, and it was painstaking to make each and every single episode. Now it's this digital, fast pace. You know, you can turn over a, a series within less than and two months of it being put on paper. Uh, what's that like for you as an actor to see that gradual change throughout time, especially the voice acting? I mean, back in the 90s, it was like, okay, we wrote the script. We don't really know how much we're doing. What's it like for your perspective to see it from 25 years ago to now? Well, from my perspective, as far as creating the animation, we're not involved in any of that part at all. Yeah, like, the, like you said, the time frame or the cells or how fast a product turns over. Basically, from my perspective, what has dr dramatically changed was the recording process. Um, maybe, like, I'd say that pool of actors are, are much more precise dubbers, and the writing has gotten better. Yeah. Because, you see, everyone gets the Japanese adaptation, but then 
then we have to, or the Japanese translation, but then the writer, which is normally possibly the writer and director, or there's a separate writer director, comes in and we completely rely on them. We rely on the writing to match those flaps and we also re re rely completely on the director to tell us where we are in the story, what we're feeling, and you know, how to you know, direct us to act the scene out by ourselves because we're not acting a scene out like in Western animation where everybody's in the room and we're, we're, we're working off each other. Um, we have to rely on that director and that's why in anime it's so important that. I think technology where we get to be able to clean and, and move things around and the technical aspect of it is more helpful and I do think that this whole group, this pool of actors, directors, writers that have kind of been through the, 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 early, days. the early days have come kind of guided and mentored and the new actors are coming in but I think they kind of really set the tone and raised you know set the set bar the bar, higher. the bar higher you know for anime so that and the actors that come in are just better and better and it's just it's really raised the bar to mainstream level and I'm so excited I'm just so excited that now more people can experience it because of social media yeah. and because of networks like Crunchyroll and Funimation and Netflix. and Netflix and everybody that's putting out products so, but you know, kudos to those original stu studios, Kevin Seymour yeah. uh, at ZRO and <laughs> Les, Les and Mary Claypool and kudos to Bang Zoom yeah. and all those studios that were really yeah, like at the, at the beginning bringing product over and, and dubbing it at, you know, professional levels. So. I also like to do workshops with fans. How, how <clears throat> when you're at an event, how do things go for you guys and what do fans hope to learn from you? Oh, well, one of the big workshops that my husband, Lex Lang, who's also voice actor, director, um, one of the big workshops we do is everything you wanted to know about VO voice er, and voiceover and voice acting. And we just don't present the anime sec segment. We present every aspect of voiceover from the professional's perspective. And how do I break in? What is the business of it? What do I need to know if that's something I desire as a career in my life? And then we kind of walk you through through the different types of voiceover and then we actually do a, a dubbing of a live action movie and, <laughs> and we get people up on the mic so they can experience it and uh, some script reading and it's just like a, it's a mini version of our two day workshop so they get an introduction and the other new one which is so exciting is Zen and the Art of Meditation. Mm -hmm. uh, I studied with Deepak Chopra, Lex and I both studied and became med meditation instructors in Primordial Sound Meditation at the Chopra Center. And so I just thought this is such a great place to bring those tools. Yeah. I mean, look at the characters like Doctor Strange, yeah. um, Avatar the Airbender, you know, but it's so many characters, they ground, they center, they power up, or they, they chill through meditation, or they use meditation to heal and regenerate their bodies, you yeah. know. So this kind of, um, this meditation is very helpful for anxiety disorder, depression, anybody on the spectrum, and they can be really overwhelmed in an environment like a Comic-Con or a, a, an anime con with a lot of people. So they walk away after a one hour course with tools and instruction on how to meditate and then take that home and meditate. So it's it's we've gotten great feedback and so it's very exciting. This year's Mitsuri Con is Magical Girl versus Mecca. What side do you support? Well, I have to support all sides because I was uh, Adele Rizzo in, um, uh, in Al Noah Zero. Even though she wasn't a Mecca, she was actually, or, you know, drive, uh, Cataphract. Yeah. She was driving the tank and trying to save the princess and everybody. She's like a great handmaiden. But then um, also, is Tachikoma considered, yeah. you know, a Mecca? Probably. But um, I would have to say magical girls because I'll tell you, mechanical things do break down. They need oil. They need, you know, repair. They need all that kind of stuff. Magical girl powers, they're just always there and they just grow and evolve like into super sailor moon powers. So super chibi moon powers. So I'd have to say magical girls because we carry our powers with us and we don't need all those mechanics. Okay. And uh, <laughs> where can... Yeah. 
Yeah. Um, Where can fans catch up with you online? Okay. And um, what message would you like to get to all your wonderful fans? Oh, okay. Fans can catch up with me on Twitter at Sandy Fox World, SandyFox.com, or on Facebook as Sandy Fox. And the message I would like to say is just be yourself and just do what you love. Be the light in the world. And then the, everything else is, you know, you don't have to worry about anything else. Just be truly, truly who you are because the world needs more of your light and your energy in the world. Alrighty, and real quick, uh, what project would you like that we didn't talk about real quick that you want fans to check out? Oh, they could check out um, Gundam Seed. Ah. I play Haro. Haro. You know, Haro. Yeah, so that's my newest project that I can talk about. <laughs> so it's pretty exciting. And always keep checking out. There's more Sailor Moon coming. More, more, more Chibi Moon. And it's going to be very, very exciting. Uh, segment of new Sailor Moon coming out. Alrighty, well, thank you so much for checking out with us, Sandy. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, everybody.